If everybody would come on in and get settled, we'll get started in here. How'd you get this quiet? I don't know. I'm I'm I've never seen it get this quiet that quickly. That's amazing. <laughs> Let's pray and get started. Father, thank you for another morning. Your mercies are new every morning, and we praise you for that. We thank you for this body and the grace that it has been and continues to be to each and every one of us. Um, just love this body. Pray that you would multiply my efforts this morning, that, we'd be glor that you would be glorified in it, that it would be uh, beneficial, educational, informative, and encouraging to all of us as we continue to study the conscience that you have given us. And what a blessing that is, what a gift it is. We thank you for that. Just pray that you guide our time and be glorified in it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first couple weeks, uh, Nate and Brian explained what the conscience is. Namely, that it's our conscious awareness of what is right and wrong at every, any given point in time. And then last week, Sean addressed what to do when our consciences condemn us. Namely, to confess, repent, and look to the cross. And then this morning, we're going to turn and look at what it means to calibrate our conscience. And part of that is understanding what is the importance of conscience in our life. And there's some questions out of the book that even a couple of years ago may have seemed theoretical, but the way that culture is moving are feeling less like that. So it's important to understand how important a good conscience is. Are you prepared to maintain a good conscience if it'll cost you your job? If your boss asked you to lie on a report to save face, would you do that to save your job? Are you prepared to maintain a good conscience even if it will cost you your business? Such as concealing a mistake that you made. As far stretched as this may sound, what if the government required abortions like they do in China to limit the amount of children that you have? Or used your tax money to fund gross injustices and evil? What if they required vaccines? Or to wear masks? What if you were not allowed to homeschool and had to send your kids to public school? Or vice versa? <laughs> what if they made you homeschool? <laughs> Would you maintain your conscience in that situation? What if the government declared that affirming things that God has deemed as evil, that you are to go contrary to God's word and declare them as good, such as LGBTQ issues? So these questions that seemed far off just a few years ago, I think a lot of us are feeling the weight of those these days. So I've, I've been deeply blessed by the study on conscience. I've been encouraged by it. I think a couple people have already alluded to the joke of 
um, finding some comfort that the voice in my head is not something to be concerned about, but that that is in fact a good thing and a gift from God. Martin Luther said that unless I'm convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. We should all share that conviction in this room about our consciences and the importance of maintaining a clear conscience for ourselves, before the Lord, and for the good of our brothers and sisters. And so that's why we're doing this study. That's why it's so important to understand how your conscience works. And as we're shifting in the study this morning, moving to um, how to adjust your conscience. Because with the weight of those questions, it would sure be a shame to hold convictions in your conscience and lose your job or go to jail lose a business, be fined or penalized in other ways for something that God has not commanded. Because one of the big ideas in this chapter, this is chapter four, by the way, is that our consciences are never in this life perfectly aligned with God's. That it is the Christian's priority to constantly be calibrating our consciences with what the Word of God says. So on any given issue related to conscience, especially considering the weight or the potential consequences of it, are you right? <laughs> are you sure? Are you right about your convictions of homeschooling? Are you right about your convictions about vaccines? Are you right about your convictions of speaking the truth always? <laughs> and in love. There's a weight to this that we need to understand. So this is, this is really um, important as we get into this. It, it should, the, the, the threat or the, the sobriety of what we're talking about related to conscience should not just be what's out there. It shouldn't just be the threat of an employer, it shouldn't just be the threat of the government, but there should also be a healthy fear and concern it should scare us to think of the consequences of sinning against our conscience, even more than the outside threats of what happens to us. You don't want to travel the path from a weak conscience to one that is wounded and defiled and emboldened to sin, then to an evil conscience, and finally to a seared conscience as hot with iron. I was talking with some pastor friends this past week, and um, we were talking about a couple of pastors that we knew, like arm length away, who had fallen into gross immorality. And not just a slip and stumble kind of fall, but a decade <laughs> of falling. And I was just asking the question, how, do, how does this happen? There should be a sobriety around that because it's, it's not just a problem out there, that's something that can happen to any of us with hardening our consciences, ignoring our consciences conditioning them to where what psychologists would call splitting, where there's just this part of you <laughs> that you can separate from the other part and, and go on functioning. Like get, get in the pulpit and teach about purity and sanctity of marriage and all of these things, meanwhile living a totally hypocritical life. Those things are not far from any of us if we don't carefully and closely guide our consciences. Um, you know, the same things would be that even our courts, as, as much as the justice system is broken in our country, we see things that the government even takes very seriously. Sexual predators, um, serial killers, things like that. People are not born that way. That's a conditioning that happens from continual hardening of our consciences. So just th the, I think the big idea through this class today and as a whole is to learn to listen to our consciences and to respond to it. That response is what we'll get into here. Because, that, and that idea is really co contrary to our society. The wisdom of our age says that guilty feelings are nearly always erroneous, hurtful, therefore we should switch them off. The truth is sometimes we feel bad because we are bad 
or because we've done bad things, where culture says, you spanked my inner child, might have deserved it. <laughs> Probably did. But, but conscience isn't just something to be afraid of. It, it's also something that has huge benefits for our lives. Conscience is like nerve endings in our hands. You can get calloused, you can condition your hands, whether it's like MMA or hard manual labor or filing them out. You can actually kill the nerves in your hands. But killing the nerves and taking away the pain that you experience in your hands when you grab a hot skillet doesn't stop the damage from happening. So think about your conscience in that way. Think about your conscience as a gift when you touch something <laughs> that you shouldn't, when you're exposed to something that you shouldn't, when you're pursuing something that you shouldn't, that recoil that happens. You don't want to become callous to those things. Uh, Jonathan Edwards wrote that the best way to keep the conscience clear is to the utmost to resist sin. And I wasn't here last week when Sean taught, but I think the other side of that coin would be to confess sin when you do it. When we do, because we all do, and we all fall short. And these things thrive in the dark. And the enemy just has a heyday with us, and our consciences condemn us, and we isolate ourselves to seek our own destruction, like Proverbs talks about, when we are not living in the light, when we're not walking in the light. On the other side, Proverbs uh, 28, 1 also says that the righteous are bold as a lion, and the wicked flee when no one pursues. I've thought about that. A lot of times we think about righteousness in terms of justification and understanding doctrinally what Christ has accomplished on the cross for us. That's an objective reality. That's something that really did happen. But there's also the subjective experience of that objective reality. And that experience of a clean conscience before the Lord is emboldening. How many of us are cowardly and don't pursue the things that God has called us to do because our consciences condemn us? Because we're lying on our taxes or looking at porn or having an emotional affair on the side or being two-faced, being an angry, hostile, condemning person at home while being an upbeat, kind, friendly person around others. There's a variety of ways that we can sear our consciences that cause us to flee, that cause us to hide, that cause us to isolate ourselves from the things that God has called us to do. That's why it's so important <laughs> to maintain a good conscience, to confess sin when we do sin, to walk in the light, for the body to come around us and encourage each other in the gospel, in the hope of the gospel when we do blow it, so that we can have boldness to do the things that God has called us to do. And another practical benefit would just be sleeping better. I sleep well with a clear conscience. <laughs> Can anybody else attest to that? Has your conscience ever kept you up all night or woken you up in the middle of the night? I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> it's a horrible feeling. With the importance of the conscience stated there, should you always obey your conscience? From what we've learned so far about conscience, who would say that you always obey your conscience? Okay. Who would say that you should not obey your conscience? You don't have to put your hands up. The principle is this. Don't sin against your conscience. Listen to your conscience and cultivate a good conscience. However, like we said earlier, no one's conscience perfectly matches God's will in this lifetime. As we mature, as we grow, it'll do that more and more. None of us have arrived at that yet. So the big idea this morning that we want to get is that you should generally always follow your conscience. Is that confusing? <laughs> generally always follow your conscience. As a general rule, you should assume that your conscience is reliable, even if it isn't perfect. And since the conscience is usually right, the Bible says that we should do what our consciences say until we are convinced from Scripture that it needs to be adjusted. I'm going to say that one more time. As a general rule, you should assume that your conscience is reliable, 
even if it isn't perfect. And since conscience is usually right, the Bible says that we should do what our conscience says until we are convinced from Scripture that it needs adjusting. A general rule means there are exceptions. Your, your conscience is not identical to the voice of God. When you're reading Scripture, or somebody brings Scripture to bear in your life, you obey. But your conscience, your conscious, your conscious awareness of what is right and wrong inside of you is not identical to the voice of God. The, that voice, your conscience, is not necessarily what God would say. So it's, it, that's why the, it's the generally always principle. So we want to be open-handed with it. We want a firm conviction about following, obeying our conscience, even to jail or losing our job or death. At the same time, holding it loosely with humility that I might not be right on this. Is your conscience theologically correct? Next week, I think Joel is on, and he's going to be taking um, Romans 14, which will un unpack it more fully. But it does not address how to calibrate your conscience. Rather, it instructs us how to love other people in your church who have different conscience standards than you. That's really important, especially this year, especially in the, we call it post-COVID. I don't know that it is post-COVID <laughs> world yet, but with everything going on and the different convictions that everybody share, you know, I'd say, I guess we don't share them, <laughs> uh, different convictions surrounding CDC guidelines, such as vaccines and which vaccines and how many vaccines and masks and social distancing, gathering together in groups like these, there's a whole lot of different thinking and even represented in this body. There's a demographic to our church, but there is a large um, discrepancy across the board here. So it is so important to do that. And I'm excited to hear what Joel's going to be talking about next week, because I think that gets to the heart of it, the heart of the body life, and what that means. I, I was thinking about an example of this. When I was probably eight or nine years old, I, I grew up in a very conservative Christian homeschool family that had a lot of rules that weren't necessarily in Scripture. One of those sur was surrounding alcohol. I'd never seen my parents have a beer, have a glass of wine, anything like that. And I was camping with my Uncle Terry and my cousins. They've got a bunch of boys. And we're out, and one night he opens a beer. And it devastated me. This man that I looked to, that I loved, that I respected, how could he do such a horrible thing? And I said something to him. I don't remember exactly what I said, but what I remember is his response. He chucked his beer into the lake. Maybe not the best solution, but it stuck with me. <laughs> I didn't have any convictions about littering at the time, so that didn't bother me. But it's like, man, what a beautiful picture of love and considering someone else's conscience. So I actually brought it up to him. I saw him a couple years ago and just said, this really marked me. You could have come down on me, told me I'm a Pharisee, told me I'm self-righteous, told me any of these things, but he loved me in that moment and cared about my sensitive little conscience enough to do anything to put aside his rights, his desires, to love me well in that. that such a beautiful picture. Were that it, that everybody has stories about us like that? <laughs> As we're growing and maturing in our consciences, I don't want to step too much on Joel's toes there, but I was thinking about that while I was reviewing this this week. What a, what a sweet example of love. So the position, so back to Romans 14, there's basically two positions in this. There's the strong conscience and the weak conscience. And... It, in general terms, the strong conscience is theologically formed and the weak conscience is uninformed. Not heretical, just uninformed on the spectrum of Christian life and maturity. Um, I think it goes without saying that a strong conscience is more desirable than a weak conscience. Why wouldn't you want your conscience to be as 
strong and informed as it could be. So calibrating our consciences, adjusting our consciences should be a priority in this life. So moving on to calibrating our consciences. Think about it in terms of a scale or a clock. Daylight savings time is coming up in a couple weeks. If you don't calibrate your clock, fall back, you're going to be late for church. Um, or a speedometer. It, it's aligning an instrument with a standard outside of itself to ensure that it's functioning accurately. Some of us may not want to adjust our scale if it's not functioning accurately or have seen the difference between your one at home or when you go to the doctor and say, no, 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 it's got to be the one at home. That's right. Or I want your scale when you get to the doctor. Or speedometers. It's, you, you ever do that? You're driving down the street and you see those flashing warning signs about speed traps. Sign comes up and it's different than what's on your dashboard. <laughs> Some, one of them's off, right? <laughs> um, so our consciences are a part of us that function like an instrument, like a scale, like a clock, like a speedometer, that doesn't always function accurately. So we need to calibrate our conscience to line it more closely with the standard of God's word. Um, an example would be Paul. Just think about how overburdened his conscience would have been, having been a Pharisee all of his life, with all kinds of extra rules. I mean, there were, I don't remember how there many extra rules there were. It was 600 or something beyond Scripture about all these things that you have to follow and watch. And that was something that had to happen for Paul, was for him to calibrate his conscience to align with what God says, not to add to his word or to take from his word, but to align it with his word. So, again, the most obvious principle of what we're talking about is that there are two principles. The first is that we obey our conscience. And occasionally, this principle of obeying our conscience, excuse me, collides with the principle that God is the Lord of our conscience. So there's reasons that our consciences may change. Three of them were listed in the chapter. Again, your consciousness is your con your conscience is your consciousness of what you believe is right at wrong, right or wrong at any given point in time, and it can change for a variety of reasons. Here's a few of them. Your conscience might become hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Some people think that their mind is broadening. Go to college, it's like, oh, my parents were so repressive, and I just need to experience these things, and I'm missing out on so many things in life. But really, your conscience is oftentimes stretching in those situations. So we're feeding excuses to our conscience is like feeding sleeping pills to a watchdog. Feeding excuses to our conscience is like feeding sleeping pills to a watchdog. You're losing your guard. I, I remember in high school, I had a youth pastor that would talk about this in terms of the law of diminishing returns. If you go do this, if you watch this movie, you're not gonna come back. If you listen to this kind of music, you're not gonna come back. If you go this far with somebody, you're not gonna come back. There was this idea, and he was right, that that is the human condition. As we expand and soften our consciences, <laughs> that we will make compromises that we don't come back from. Your conscience also might follow the standards of other people, such as your culture, family, spiritual leaders. Simply go with the flow without thinking about it. Um, an example would be, I went to school in Virginia my freshman year. I pretty much grew up in Colorado, so it's quite the culture shock. And there was like this motto of Southern Christianity, basically, of don't smoke, drink, or chew, or go with girls who do. Well, I'd say that's probably advisable. <laughs> it's not something that's clearly spelled out in Scripture. But you can just adopt these things. A cultural Christianity, where there's no true love for God or other people. It's just what we do because we're Southern or Bible Belt. That can exist here, too, not just to pick on the South. That can just be because we're homeschooled. It can be just because, you know, we're conservatives or we live south of Hampton Boulevard instead of north of Hampton Boulevard, like the new Mason-Dixie line in our state. Um, you know, voting would be another one. You just go with the flow. If you're raised in a conservative family, you are most likely to vote 
conservative. If you're raised in a liberal family, you're most likely to vote liberally without even really thinking about these things. And I was, there's this old quote by the Danish philosopher Kierkegaard that the crowd is untruth. There should be a sense in which we are, um, and not in a critical spirit kind of way, but a critical thinking kind of way, wanting to understand what is going on around us. Why is everybody doing what they're doing? If everybody's doing it, mob mentality, there's probably a chance that something's off. Another reason um, why our conscience might change is um, to conform more to the truth, especially the truth of God's word. Um, Again, depending where you live, what your background is, there are things, and I'm just going to give you a spectrum. Some of them might just sound abhorrent. to like, who would do that? So living with your boyfriend or girlfriend, sleeping with them before you're married. People do that with a clear conscience. People have abortions with a clear conscience. People lie with a clear conscience or they gossip with a clear conscience. And then you can ask, start, even start going even further into our personal lives on steward, stewardship of our time and money. How are we spending those? Are we doing that with a clear conscience because it's right before God or because we've been conditioned and have conditioned ourselves to feel okay about these things? So now there's, a, now there's kind of a distinction here to look at, and that is between sinning against your conscience and calibrating your conscience. To, tra- to train and educate your conscience is not a sin. I'm sorry, it's not a sin against it, but it's to put it under the lordship of Christ. You are sinning against your conscience when you believe your conscience is speaking correctly and yet you refuse to listen to it. That's an important distinction. You are sinning against your conscience when you believe your conscience is speaking correctly and yet you refuse to listen to it. You must obey your conscience if you believe that it's functioning correctly, even if it's at great cost. Your job, your business, your money, whatever the case may be. As Mark Dever put it, conscience cannot make a Let me get this right. (laughs) Conscience cannot make a wrong thing right, but it can make a right thing wrong. In in the chapter, they talk about root beer. If you have a conviction that it is wrong to drink root beer and there is no biblical prohibition to drinking root beer, for you to disobey your conscience in that instance is sin. If you believe that drinking root beer is wrong. Um, So, we don't want to sin against our conscience, but we do want to calibrate our conscience. You're calibrating your conscience when Christ, the Lord of your conscience, teaches you through his scriptures that your conscience has been incorrectly warning you about a particular matter. So, you're reading your Bible, having your daily quiet times, do your one-year Bible. I didn't see root beer in there once. Nothing about root, not even root beer floats, nothing in there. And you can calibrate your conscience at that point and saying, okay, you know what? I've sought this out. I've sought the word. I've sought counsel. Is drinking root beer wrong? (laughs) And if it changes and you are convinced in your mind that that is not wrong, you're free to do it. Um, Now, something to keep in mind is that in the early stages of calibration, deciding not to listen to your conscience may feel like you're sinning against it that first sip of root beer that you have, might feel like sin. For me, one was my freshman year of high school, we had this uh, speech and debate class that we were doing. I don't even exactly remember what the resolution was, Um, but I think it it had to do with boycotting or boycotting Disney or something like that. And I read a book um, in the side that I was representing in the debate, and it was basically... Um, part, of, part of it exposed um, how much funding and uh, support Disney gives to support abortion. Like, really? The kids thing is like wanting to wipe out their future clientele? 
And I, so I think I was like 14 years old, and I was so convicted of this. My family had already planned a trip to Florida, and going to Disney World was part of that. My, con my parents did a good job in honoring my conscience. I was just like, I, I can't go. And it was sweet of my brother. He supported me, and we just stayed back while the rest of my family went and enjoyed Disney World. But my conscience was condemning me in that instance. Now, so a few years later, we're back, and I went to Disneyland, or Disney World, whichever one's in Florida. Was I sinning against my conscience in that? And the answer is that I could have been sinning against my conscience if I shared the same conviction that to do this, to go to Disney World, is to support abortion and affirm um, things that are contrary to God's view of the sanctity of human life. Um, my convictions about abortion hadn't changed at all. But what had changed was my thinking about what is this, this idea of a sacred secular divide? And what does it mean to be in the world and not of the world? And to um, realize that, it, that there's a, almost a freedom that comes in not asking where the meat came from <laughs> kind of thing, to where I, I could, with a clear conscience, go and enjoy Disney World. I think it was only about three years later. That was a shift that had happened in my own consciousness. Doing the exact same activity three years prior would have been wrong than it was to do it when I actually went. We're constantly changing. We should constantly be changing in our understanding. Sometimes that has to happen quickly, like Peter um, had to do it really quickly. <laughs> when Jesus said, eat, drink, they're like, I can't do that. You told me not to do that. Right? When, when the word of God comes and it's clear, we have to follow his word, and sometimes it just happens really quickly. So how do you calibrate your conscience? Calibrate your conscience by educating it with truth. As best you can, try to discern the why. Why you hold a certain conviction. The why really matters. Regular diet of scripture will strengthen a weak conscience or restrain an overly active one. Conversely, error, human wisdom, and wrong moral influences filling the mind will corrupt or cripple a conscience. Keep in mind that we are always being discipled all the time by something. So what we're putting in to ourselves is discipling, is, is training us how we think. There are things that are on the conscious issue spectrum today that were not here 10 years ago. The fair trade type conversations. I'm not saying that's good or bad. That's just a reality. Um, When we say you need to calibrate your conscience by informing your conscience with truth, we mean primarily the truth of the Bible, but it's not solely the truth of the Bible. <clears throat> Sometimes our conscience is mistaken because we've applied biblical principles the wrong way due to being misinformed about truth outside the Bible. Um, I'm going to pick on social media here briefly. <laughs> we can pick up that conversation if any of you want to. In social media, if you're using YouTube, Facebook, Google, Twitter, any of those things, what's the product? What's being sold? You, exactly. I'm the product. You're the product. They're not selling me something. You wonder why they give it away for free? It's because we are the product in that. Now, there's two principles that drive this. There's, the first is called homophily, which literally means love of the same. And then confirmation bias is the other. So you have this homophily, this love of self, or love of the same, and then confirmation bias, which means I'm going to be drawn to whatever affirms whatever I already believe. So if I believe, pick something abstract here so I don't get in trouble, that, um, you know, Smurfs are real. 
I am going to start being drawn to those things. And all of these social media companies, our business, and we're the product, their algorithms are going to direct me to those things to confirm my bias that Smurfs are real. Does that make sense, what I'm saying there? Okay, so you get homophily plus confirmation bias equals self-segregation. What naturally happens when they put these things together is you segregate yourself. There have been studies done by, um, I think it was MIT, that just showed um, kind of terrifying results of how, um, how surprised people were that other opinions or ideas existed beyond their own. People who are immersed in this, because that is what's being fed to you. It's just what you believe. So you're segregated from any other opinion or other people who may disagree with you. Now, from a Christian perspective, this algorithm is designed around pride on a fundamental basis. If we're the product, how do they get us to sell us? They appeal to our pride. Because people love to be right. Don't we? And we hate to be wrong. But Proverbs would say that the person who doesn't want correction is a fool. So don't be a fool, don't be naive. Now, this is the world that we live in. I'm not here to say don't use social media, don't you know, use your news app on your phone. It, I'm not making that point at all, I'm just saying don't be ignorant about these things. The information that you are getting is not the same information that your neighbor is getting. Is that true? We've got one person who works here for Global. <laughs> so just be aware of that, be aware of that, that yes, there's truth inside of scripture first and foremost, an example of this would be loving your neighbor. We can see that plainly in Scripture. This is what I'm called to do. This is what Christ came to purchase. This is what he's empowered me to do, is to love my neighbor. And you can look at something like vaccines, mandate, you know, mask mandates, social distancing, and two Christians, your brother or sister in the Lord, can arrive at completely different conclusions. And in large part, that has to do with the information that they're getting. So both are seeking to honor the Lord in whatever they're doing, whether getting a vaccine or not, wearing a mask or not, communing together with people in close proximity or not. So there should be a humility that we have in approaching these things. You know, to, to say one, one has the position that, you know, you know, even as Governor Polis said, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, the golden rule, get the vaccine. That's a conclusion that he jumps to, not considering that there are people who don't want to get the vaccines or who don't want to wear masks or social distance because they believe that there are greater dangers than getting sick. But do you see that? Is that making sense how both parties of this, you know, very abstract issue that nobody's talking about or concerned about, <laughs> how people can approach that from different perspectives, both seeking to love the Lord, to be obedient to him, to love neighbors, and arrive at completely different conclusions. Don't be ignorant. Don't be naive. Don't be a fool when it comes to the information that you're receiving. Fake news is everywhere. And it's not just conservative side or liberal side or libertarian side or whatever it is. It's everywhere. So have the humility to say, this could be wrong. I could be wrong. What, what's the source of this? Due diligence in that. Okay, I'm going to move on from that before I get myself in too much trouble. <laughs> um, okay, calibrating your conscience with due process. We were just talking about that. <clears throat> Um, so there's two ways that, basic ways that we calibrate, two basic methods. One is by adding to, and the other is by subtracting from. Of course, in most situations, um, conscience calibration involves both addition and subtraction. Adding a restriction to your conscience often means subtracting a freedom, and vice versa. Excuse me. Adding to your conscience. Our conscience may be malfunctioning because we've deeply absorbed sinful 
worldview of this age. Um, we talked about several of those things, living together um, before you're married and abortion, gossip, some of these things that you can, that your conscience needs to be added to. If there are things that are clearly expressed in the word of God, thou shalt not, or thou shall, <laughs> and that's not in line with how you're acting or thinking, then you need to add to your conscience. You need to raise that bar. So this, to live in a manner worthy of the gospel would be the big idea on that. Just because you can sin with a clear conscience doesn't mean that what you're doing is okay. You need to get that. Just because you feel good about something, just because you feel okay about something, doesn't make it okay, doesn't make it right. When it comes to sin, you are responsible to calibrate your own conscience. That's your responsibility, not anyone else's. I was driving with my son the other day. He's like, what if you didn't know what the speed limit was? Like, I've tried that one. Didn't, <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> it's my responsibility to know what the speed limit is on the road and to calibrate my speed to match that standard which is there. <laughs> the other way to do it is subtracting from your conscience. Rather than live in a perpetual state of going against your conscience, you must train your conscience. You might calibrate your conscience by subtracting unnecessary rules from it. Um, just throwing these out as an example, and there's probably difference in opinion um, on some of these things. You know, getting tattoos. There's a verse in Leviticus that says not to. But there's also theological understanding that informs that verse that may lead you to have freedom to get a tattoo or not to get a tattoo. But across the board, thou shalt not have tattoos written to <laughs> followers of Christ. There's not that command. That doesn't mean that you have to get one. I think Joel's going to touch on that tomorrow. Just because you have a freedom doesn't mean that you have to use it. <clears throat> Um, another example would be music. It's sinful to listen to particular kinds of music. All right, high school, college kids, that's, that's always a hot topic, the type of music that we're listening to. Is it sinful to listen to a certain kind of music? Um, is it sinful to celebrate Halloween? or Christmas, or Easter. And there are people in here, because I know a lot of you, that some are saying, yes, it's sin. Why could you, how could you do that? How could you know the roots of that? And I'm not saying that to mock you. I'm saying you have an informed conscience that is telling you this is wrong. This is aligned with pagan worship, pagan ritual, pagan history, all that, and you have strong convictions about that. I'm not saying that to mock it. Sincerely. Is it wrong to celebrate Halloween? Yes. <laughs> the other side of it could be um, several years ago, um, this was actually my wife's idea, we started putting tables out and chili and hot cider, hot cocoa, because it was an opportunity to meet neighbors that we never saw before because they'd pull in their garage and hide from us every time they got home from work. And that was an opportunity to build relationships with them. It was also an opportunity to establish our house as a house on the street where kids knew that there were friendly people that could be trusted that they could come to if they were ever in trouble. So again, there's an example of you can arrive at completely different conclusions on that. We don't do it in our current neighborhood because we don't have any neighbors <laughs> really close to us. <laughs> that would be a waste of time. Um, you know, Christmas would be another one. I have a, one of my best friends has strong convictions about not celebrating Christmas. Like, won't do the tree, won't do the lights, any of that. And we have mutual respect and love for each other. He has good, strong, valid reasons to not do that. Um, yeah, Easter would be the same thing. Just to think through those things. Are there things that we need to subtract from our conscience? How are we doing here? So something to think through on this and... Um, I wish we had time to get into it more, and I'm hoping maybe some other guys that are going to be teaching will touch on this some more. But what's, 
what, what, what's the role of the family? What's the role of parenting when it comes to our kids' consciences? They're people too. They're created in the image of God. They've been given consciences. What is our role in that? Because a lot of times we can even think about, um, let me step back. Think about things in your own life, think conscience issues that you've been concerned about, that you've had to calibrate, that you've adjusted as you've grown and matured. I shared, you know, the one about drinking beer and my uncle loving me enough. Um, when I was thanking him for that, we were having a beer, right? Things <laughs> had changed. My conscience has changed. He loved me well when I had a conviction against that, but we were also sharing a beer at, um, while I was thanking him for loving me so well. So we can have these rules that come from our families to believe that certain things are wrong that may or may not be wrong. And our kids, especially as they get in those teenage years, asking questions isn't always rebellion. There are legitimate, sincere questions that should be asked. Um, even in my own story, a lot of my own rebellion was driven by asking questions, of course, with the perfect humility of a <laughs> high school kid, but asking sincere questions, not trying to be obnoxious, but like, I don't see this in the Bible. Why, why are these rules here? This doesn't make any sense to me to engage those questions in a healthy way. Because you can come out of your home believing things like, it is a sin to watch TV. Dating is a sin. Real Christians court. I'm not saying this to mock anybody's convictions. I know that they vary a lot through this room. But does the Bible say that? Are there principles that inform this? Yes, absolutely. But as parents, part of our job is to help inform our kids' consciences and to help them calibrate their own consciences, not leaving home with a list of burdens that God hasn't given them to bear. Education, homeschool, private school, public school, the real Christians homeschool or go to Christian school or you know, wouldn't go to, dare go to public school. But the Lord's not honored and that kind of attitude that we have towards each other. And when it comes to conscience, it's about me, what's right and wrong for me and for my family. Music, the clothing we wear, should you have any kind of debt? Is house debt an acceptable alternative to having no debt? Vaccines, masks, recycling, um, whether or not you wear shoes in the house. So the use of social media and what ages? birth control, to use it or not, or when to start having kids, if you're married, and Santa Claus, do you want to perpetuate that or not? Um, how you vote, and the list could just go on and on and on, we could keep going, and nobody's going to agree on these things, and again, which is where Joel's teaching next week on love should guide how we interact with each other in these things, but it's not this passive, um, kind of love that just um, has no conviction, has no spine. We should hold our convictions strongly. It's important. That's what the whole first part of what I was talking about is how important it is to maintain a clear conscience, to hold our convictions without exception, but also to do that with humility, knowing that none of us has a perfectly calibrated conscience, and to be open to discussing with each other engaging with each other, that, <clears throat> and at the end of the day, that love, that people are more important than my freedoms, I think would summarize what Joel's going to be teaching on next week. So in short, conclusion, we must also know what freedoms and constraints are ours in Jesus Christ. The only way to achieve this maturity is to think through Scripture again and again to try to grasp the system of thought how the parts cohere and combine to make sense. So be about this. This should be a priority in your life, thinking through these issues, understanding what a gift a conscience is, how much it's protected me from, how much it's affirmed in my life. I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful to have a conscience. That's a, that's a good gift from a loving creator. Um, I think we've got like two minutes if there's any questions, if I dare.
after throwing out all those landmines to step on, do I want to? <laughs> all right. Well, good. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> Father, again, we thank you for your mercy and kindness towards us, for your love for us. Thank you for consciences and um, thank you for this room. I thank you. Um, that even our differences in consciences and our convictions are opportunities to love and grow in love for one another. I pray that we'd continue to do that as a body and glorify you in that. Uh, prepare our hearts and minds here as we prepare to worship together. In Jesus' name, amen. I think Avery Wine started in that. <laughs> <laughs> Never get out of here. Keep going.